Get free tech advice for your business from O2 Gurus. Search O2 Business for more. Hey guys, welcome to BTech. It's Basil here with an Apple iPhone 6 and a whole bunch of smartphones. We've got the iPhone 6 because it's an iPhone 6 review and we've got the whole bunch of smartphones because it's an iPhone 6 review. We need to contextualize why we think what we think about this phone and areas it could get a little bit better perhaps. But one thing we will say from the offset is that we're really happy about the whole size increase thing. The iPhone 5S was a very attractive bit of kit. We always admired it from a distance despite the fact we had one for a couple of months and then had to give one back etc. We never actually chose to use it as our primary phone. The main reason being, look, giant hands absolutely dwarf this thing. Couldn't type on this one comfortably at all. The iPhone 6 by contrast is significantly easier to type on if you do have larger hands without being as overbearing as the iPhone 6 Plus which is at the bottom of this pile here. We'll come on to that in a little while. As far as the iPhone 6's design goes, it's got a really curvaceous body, curved glass around the sides that really does add to iOS 8's edge to edge swiping, top to bottom swiping, really high quality glass as well. Feels very, very comfortable to hold in the hand. Despite the fact you've got big bezels on here, Apple's made allowances for the height of the screen with that double tap feature. And it does work pretty well. A couple of reviewers have said it kind of feels like an afterthought that has just been tacked on. If it is one, then it's been done very very well because it really, really does work. And it works across all applications, not just the home screen. So what can you expect to find on this phone? On the front is that 4.7 inch display. The screen itself has a pixel density of 326, so it's gonna be nice and sharp, retaining that retina resolution of the Apple iPhone 5S, but it isn't gonna compete with Android flagships with pixel densities from 441 right through to 500, etc., like the LG G3 and coming up, upcoming Note 4. You've also got a front-facing camera, an in-call speaker. Down below the screen is a home button. This home button is awesome doubles up as a fingerprint scanner that works. It actually really, really does work. So just press the button, press your finger on it, and it will open up, unlock the phone securely, relatively securely. It also doubles up, like we said, with just a double tap as a capacitive button to bring the whole UI down a little bit. Double tap and it works as a multitasking button and long press and it activates Siri. Now we're talking about the UI though. So let's move on to the right hand side so we can finish talking about the design and you can see a power button, nano SIM card slot down at the base, loudspeaker, a lightning connector, 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, volume buttons and a toggle. Up at the top, no buttons at all, but on the flip side is that rear facing camera, eight megapixels with a true tone LED flash and an Apple insignia. All in all, the iPhone 6 is a beautiful, beautiful bit of kit. It feels slimmer than it is thanks to those curvaceous edges. We had it in a comparison with the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, which we can actually grab here. And despite the fact that the Samsung Galaxy Alpha is thinner, thanks to those rounded sides, it does actually feel like a thicker device than Apple's offering. While we've got that in frame, we might as well start doing a few comparisons. And we're gonna start with the Alpha. As you can see, the Alpha is shorter than the iPhone 6 is. It's also slightly narrower. It's got a, uh, the same size display, 4.7 inches, unlike that of the iPhone 5S. The iPhone 5S has been updated to iOS 8. It's virtually identical on the inside. It's a much, much shorter device, four inch display by contrast, 4.7 inch display. It's also got that same home button, but it doesn't have the functionality which you can bring your home screen UI down because it doesn't really need it given that it is such a small device by comparison. If we were to move that out of the way, we can bring in a Sony Xperia Z3 Compact. The Z3 Compact really is one of the main competitors to the iPhone 6, largely because despite being so much shorter, it's got a very similar sized screen, 4.6 inches by contrast, 4.7 inches. It's also only 350 pounds, despite having a Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 processor in there. Very powerful bit of kit, significantly smaller, and it's waterproof too, one of the best contenders of 2014. If we take a look at the Samsung Galaxy S5. This is another flagship. It's taller, it's wider, it's water resistant, not waterproof. It doesn't feel premium, it feels plastic, but it does feel like if you drop it, the world won't end. Whereas the iPhone 6 feels really, really precious. Having said that, you should check out some of the drop tests online if you haven't already. This thing's a lot hardier than uh, meets the eye. If we were to take a look at an HTC M8 for a size comparison, the M8 is very tall, and that's because it's got stereo speakers up top and bottom. You can see how 
how it stacks up height wise, it is a fair bit taller. We've got a Nokia Lumia 930 here. Again, similar kinds of heights. The iPhone's actually a little bit taller. The Lumia has a five inch display, but the Lumia is much, much wider and much, much more masculine with those very, very flat sides and corners. Sony Xperia Z3, another flagship, much more similar kind of price point. The Sony Xperia Z3 does look feel more angular still got a metal body feels super premium but it does also have that waterproofing which is a very very nice touch and bringing an Oculumia 830 in the 830 is more comparable with the iPhone 6 and the 930 it's well specced it's got a Snapdragon 400 processor so not super premium but it only costs 300 pounds just like the Z3 compact or about 50 quid less than the Z3 compact the BlackBerry Passport this is way way wider and generally a completely different offering it's still very premium you've got three gig of RAM on here as well as a Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 processor it's also got the biggest capacity battery cell I've ever seen on a smartphone of this day and age. 3450 milliamps, which is absolutely crazy. 4.5 inch display with a high resolution um, pixel density even than the iPhone 6. It's got a PPI of around 450, which is mighty, mighty good. LG G3 time. The LG G3, despite having a much larger display, 5.5 inches by contrast to 4.7, it hasn't actually got that big a surface area by comparison and actually feels pretty comfortable in the hand thanks to the fact you've got that curvaceous backing and it's plastic so it's less of a cold stark material last but definitely not least in fact the most obvious comparison the iphone 6 and 6 plus as you can see the 6 plus with its 5.5 inch display is just much bigger in every respect the screen practically engulfs the iphone 6. both of them look identical though and pack almost identical specs save for the optical image stabilization on the camera on the 6 plus and a couple of other little bits such as a higher pixel per inch and battery um, performance so that's how it stacks up against the competition the areas the iphone 6 really does stand out just after having held all those is in that finesse it feels solid everyone says oh it bends well it doesn't feel like it's going to bend anytime soon it feels premium it feels stark it feels metal it feels expensive and that's because it is you do get what you pay for when it comes to the iphone if we take a look at that screen it's also brilliant quality it isn't the sharpest on the block the lg g3 has a much much higher pixel count so we can pull that into frame very very quickly and you can see very clearly if we take a look at the actual typography on the G3 it looks absolutely pin sharp it doesn't look bad by any means on the iPhone 6 but it definitely isn't as sharp when you pull right up close you may at a push be able to see a pixel still makes for a brilliant ebook reader games look fantastic on it you can't notice a pixel for the life of you if you're looking at a movie or a picture and obviously for all the other stuff you're going to use the screen for the user interface etc it's going to perform absolutely adequately speaking of that user interface iOS 8 does a very 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 good job of actually just being better than its predecessor. Okay, there was instability in a lot of areas when it launched and indeed the iOS 8.0.2 update isn't perfect, but you can now swap out your keyboard so you can include things like SwiftKey. You can also have a manual camera application should you download one. Apple released the APIs for manual cameras and we'll come on to that later. There's also been a few changes to the actual core user interface. Swipe down and you've got a very snappy spotlight search. Swipe down from the top for all your widgets and your calendar. You can actually customize your widgets. So if we press edit, we can get rid of the ones that we don't use and add the ones that we do. If we jump out of that, we can pull down and we can see on the left hand side, you've got notifications right there. You've also got like with old um, iOS, double tap to activate multitasking, long press for Siri, and like we said earlier again, double tap in order to bring the whole user interface down. So it's not super complicated, but it's more fully functional than its predecessor. The application support is going to be stupendous, naturally as is games, and really iOS is just getting better. Hopefully Apple will be able to iron out the niggles ASAP. There are still occasions where, for example, we'll tap on a text entry field and our keyboard won't pop up and we'll have to force close the app etc so it isn't perfect anyone who is coming from android who's expecting a completely seamless experience don't but it's definitely worth the occasional grumps thanks to the smoothness 99 percent of the time 
just like Google has all its own drive services, etc., so too does Apple have iCloud. And iCloud will sync all your photos, it'll back up your phone. You have to pay a subscription, but that said, if you just want to back up your core profile, the five gigabytes on board should be enough. It'll also back up application data as well. So you won't have to reinstall all your applications manually when you do upgrade from an iPhone 5S to an iPhone 6, for example. If, however, you're coming clean from Android, you will have to install your little heart out. Still, it's quite a good experience going through the application store because obviously Apple's App Store is pretty rich. It looks great and there are a whole load of applications. Apple's also included bundles, which is a really neat way of buying a ton of applications that have a similar ilk. So for example, you can buy all the Infinity Blade games or all the Final Fantasy games, or indeed you can buy wellness apps or kids bundles too. So again, a cohesive element to Apple's ecosystem in the application store and the onboard app experience. As far as multimedia goes, you've got loads of stuff on here. Ebook reading is gonna be an absolute doddle based on the fact you can download loads of ebook readers, get your own EPUB books on here if you wanted to, and you can also obviously support things like Kindle, Marvel Unlimited for comics, and that bigger screen is gonna be really, really welcome. Jumping out of that, we can also see there's loads and loads of movie applications. Just like with Android, you've got iPlayer, you've got Netflix, YouTube, Crunchyroll, and well, you're never gonna really want for anything as far as application support on multi media terms goes. As far as the audio goes, we've got the 64 gig version. If you do like music, you do like downloading movies offline, do not get the 16 gigabyte version, whatever you do. Get the 64 or 128 gigabyte version. It is more expensive, but it will be worth it four months down the line when you fill up your storage. The audio from the loudspeaker is good until you cover it up. Anytime you're gaming, anytime you're listening to music and just thumb over it, it instantly mutes it, which is a real, real shame. We can demo this super quickly by just jumping into one of our videos, for example. And we can see as soon as it loads up the video. This video is brought to you by three. So it's a real shame that um, Apple hasn't integrated stereo speakers. Lord knows there's enough bezel to do it, but they just haven't. And we can't wait for an iPhone that has. That might be the next thing with the iPhone 6S. Let's hope it is. As far as other multimedia stuff goes, games. Games are really going to be one of the super high points of this thing. Like we said, you've got the choice for starters. We've installed a fair few games. We've installed 2D games. We've installed 3D games. The new Metal Engine is showcased with a couple of games such as Modern Combat 5 and Zen Garden. Infinity Blade 3 looks mind-blowing. And obviously you've got a lot more fun games on here like Angry Birds, etc. So there's a lot you can do in terms of procrastinating on this. And however you end up doing it, it's going to look great. I'm moving on to that camera and the eight megapixel camera performs pretty brilliantly. Tap on the screen, take your picture, but that isn't all it is. If you tap on the screen and drag up, you increase the exposure, drag down, you reduce the exposure. So it's really nice insofar as there's more customization than iOS allowed prior. Every time you re-tap on a new area, it does reset that exposure. You've also got the option to take square photos, panorama photos, and if we swipe back to regular photos, you can also overlay a filter as well, and you can switch HDR on or off. As far as the video goes, it records at full HD resolution. It looks good, color reproduction is good. Unfortunately, image stabilization could really do with a helping hand from Sony, for example. As far as slow-mo goes, it records at 240 frame per second at slow motion video, and it records time-lapse video too. So there is plenty to get your teeth into. What Apple has also done is open up the APIs to make applications um, that take advantage of manual camera controls. So if we were to see here, we can see we've got focus, we've got white balance, shutter speed, etc. all things we can control, and that's a manual camera application. It didn't quite go as slow as far as shutter speed as we would have liked it to. We couldn't quite get light trails like on the Nokia Lumias, but having some control is better than no control, and that could well be a limitation of the app. We're not entirely sure. The actual quality of the images from the iPhone 6 are improved over those of the 5S. This is particularly noticeable in low light. Even without the optical image stabilization, there's less grain that comes through by comparison to its predecessor. It's also better than pretty much every other camera 
phone on the market for just being a quick point and shoot. And we mean camera phone that doesn't have a physical shutter key. Android phones tend to be a little bit more time consuming to open up the camera app, take the picture, etc. If you were taking a look at landscape shots, they will pack a decent detail. Eight megapixels is ample and the six by four aspect ratio is actually quite novel because it means you're getting a full eight megapixel image. In addition to that, it takes decent portraits. The flash performance is very accurate as far as white balance goes. And for portraits, it all looks very, very on point. It also has more tapered saturation than the likes of Samsung phones, making for one of the best camera phones around today, even with the lack of optical image stabilization, which we didn't find made the world of difference. As far as connections go, the iPhone 6 has NFC in name, but not really function. Sure, it supports Apple Pay, which should be coming to the UK eventually, but it doesn't support one-touch pairing. It doesn't support file sharing using NFC as a contact point, etc. So Apple's kind of underwhelmed us on that front. What you do have on here is L LTE. Again, Cat 4 LTE as opposed to the Cat 6 LTE on the Samsung Galaxy Alpha, Samsung Galaxy Note 4 and Huawei SN Mate 7, which means speeds of 150 megabytes per second as opposed to 300. Sure, this only applies to London now and, if, and the EE network. But having said that, this should be the flagship for the next year for Apple. So we're guessing many people will buy this for the next couple of years and will be underwhelmed by the fact they're not getting the very latest and best internet speeds. Everything else though is pretty top notch. You've got 3G, you've got GPS, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, etc. Don't have an infrared blaster on here, but Apple's never had an infrared blaster, so that's no real big loss. And that fingerprint scanner works a absolute treat. The iPhone 6 battery should last at least a day for most users. We're power users, and we found that it started dying by around 7 p.m., which actually isn't too bad when you compare it to other Android phones. So sure, the 1810 milliamp capacity isn't mind-blowing, but Apple's iOS 8 tends to be more efficient than Android from our experience with both. And with that, we finished the majority of our iPhone 6 review and we're down to wrapping up. Like we said earlier, if you are gonna get one of these, make sure that you buy a 64 or 128 gigabyte version. Applications are getting bigger. You're gonna wanna store your music on here, a few movies, you're gonna be recording movies as well. Full HD movies take up space and that 16 gigabytes of storage will fill up in a couple of months. Even if you're a light user, it'll probably take you around three or four months. So 64 gigabyte, without a doubt, if you're prepared to put out that kind of money for your phone, then you will definitely be rewarded. The App Store support supplies a rich array of applications. The user experience is pretty seamless throughout. iOS is being ironed out as far as iOS 8's kinks go, but generally speaking, from beginning to end, the hardware matches the software and the user experience is very, very expensive. It is big though, so our next major take home would be if it is too big, check out the iPhone 5S. This is still a very current smartphone. If you want a more current smartphone, the Sony Xperia Z3 Compact may actually sway you in the way of Android if you want something that's a little bit more manageable in the hand. Obviously, the iPhone 6 Plus is a fabler option, but if you do want something bigger, the Note 4 is out as well. Can Android compete? Absolutely. iPhones don't have front facing speakers. They're not waterproof, for example. The user interfaces aren't crazy customizable, but there is definitely a lot to be said for hardware that really matches software inside. And of course, a seamless user experience 95% of the time. If you want to ask us any questions about the iPhone 6, fire them in the comments section below. If you like the video, click that like button. And if you like BTEC in general, click subscribe. Thanks for watching.